But, um, but yeah, so retinal detachment is pretty rare. They're not that common, actually. So uh, most people you know have not had a retinal detachment. Um, but for whatever reason, and we can talk a little bit about it, um, they're very uh, well described, taught, and pretty much everybody who's heard of an eye problem is um, taught about this particular issue. And for that reason, I think it's a really good topic to cover. Now, um, I'm originally from Toronto and I'm now working not only in Toronto, but also in New York and I'm a retina specialist. So this is kind of what I do. Um, although this is something that I do often, it's actually a small piece of my practice. And that's, like I said, because it's not the most common thing that we deal with. Um, that being said, it's something that people are uh, concerned about and something that if you end up either going into, into ophthalmology, you're going to deal a lot with, or if you end up being on an ophthalmology rotation or some rotation that's associated with it, um, you're either going to be asked a lot of questions about or asked to deal with. So I think this is a really good reason to kind of learn a little bit more about it. Um, to kind of get a sense of the audience, I wanted to get to know you guys a little bit. So MS1 to MS4, there's a varying um, degree of knowledge about this topic. So I'll try to kind of be um, inclusive of everybody, but um, please in the chat, like if you have a question and you see something you don't understand, just let me know and I can go back. We have plenty of time. So there's really no rush here. So without further ado, unless you guys have any questions, I'll just go ahead and start. So, um, great. So I'll start with the basics. So first, you know, what is the retina? So, I mean, this is the eye and this is, um, so I'll start with the fact that none of these images are my own. I'm not a really good artist, um, but this particular image is from the American Academy of Ophthalmology. It's uh, illustration by Mark Miller. And it's a basic description of the eye cut in half so you can see kind of through it. And the retina is actually a really, really thin piece that you can't really see here, um, but they kind of blew up and they made it a little bit bigger. It's that yellow area at the back of the eye. And you can see a little divot there. And uh, let's see if I have my annotation here. Aha. And please do let me know if you can't see something. But So this uh, little divot here is the fovea. And the retina, although it's not to scale, is the area between these two arrows. And the reason I show you this is because um, the retina does really go not all the way around, but it does go quite a far, oh, didn't mean to do that. Does not go all the way, um, does not go all the way around the eye to the front of the eye, but does go quite a bit out. And so there is peripheral retina, like out here and out here. And there's pretty central retina where your center vision is, which is over here. And that's really different because the different areas of the retina have different functions, but also um, in terms of pathology and in terms of um, how you deal with it, it would be different whether you're in the periphery or uh, in the center part of the vision. Okay, so. Um, so to kind of describe the retina a little bit, it's useful to kind of think about location. So if we think about the optic nerve in the center, and again, I'm gonna, can you guys see my mouse? I hope you do, but if not, I'll try to draw. Um, let's see if I can draw here. So the optic nerve over here, okay. And the center part of the fovea, sorry, the center part of the eye is the fovea right here. And I'll put an X on it because that's how usually we draw it out. Uh, and that's your center vision. But around the fovea, you have this area called the macula. And the macula, there's different ways to describe it. Um, there's like a, um, um, there is an anatomical description, which is this one around surrounding the arcades. Um, there's also a description that deals with the type of cells that are found in the macula, which is maybe beyond this talk. Uh, but there's different ways to describe it. Essentially, it's a center part of your uh, of the back of your eye, and that's responsible for the important vision. So things like reading, uh, seeing faces, uh, driving, um, fine vision, and that's really important. Now, the peripheral vision, which I'm going to outline over here. Um, and over here maybe, and over here, and over here. Although very important to things like ambulation, moving around, seeing in the dark, uh, making sure that if something comes your way that you turn your head, it is very important and without it, people have a lot of trouble. It's maybe not as important as the macula in certain tasks. So it's important to differentiate those areas, especially as we're talking about things um, further on in this talk. So since we're talking about retinal attachments and we kind of introduced the idea of the retina, 
I want to give you an opportunity to kind of let me know what you know. So there's three types, and I'll give you that part, but there's three types of retinal detachment. So what are the three types of retinal detachment? And this is an opportunity for us to have a little question. So I don't know if uh, we have our uh, question uh, software working and maybe give it like a minute here and see how, uh, how you guys do. But remember, there's three types. And if you were to break it up into three, how would you do it? Okay, I see Rebecca there with, a, with one answer. That's great, Rebecca. Wonderful, Damn. perfect, perfect. Yeah, exactly, that's pretty good, good, good. So it looks like we have all of them in there. So um, RRD from Daniel, um, tractional from Amon and regmatogenous from Rebecca. So that's right. So there's three types, uh, regmatogenous, tractional, exudative. We're gonna talk in brief about each of them. We're really gonna focus on number one, a little bit on number two and number three less so because in order, they're probably in order of frequency that you'll see them in a primary ophthalmology clinic. Um, and probably in terms of importance as a medical student and early residency, you kind of want to know them in this order because you're going to deal with them in this order. So let's talk a little bit about retinal detachment, the regmatogenous variety. That's the first one. Okay, so like all things in medicine, it's either Latin or Greek, right? And there's a few other words that we borrow. Uh, ophthalmology is pretty good about uh, um, German borrow words also because a lot of famous early ophthalmologists were from Germany. Um, but this particular word comes from Greek, uh, regma means break. And break because there's the etiology, the underlying cause of this type of retinal detachment is a break, a break in the retina. And then fluid passing from one cavity, the center of the eye, underneath um, the retina through this break. And again, the incidence, if you see, is pretty low. So I remember I said that it's actually not a common thing in ophthalmology, we see it a lot. And like all things in medicine, we have a, like a skewed view of the world, uh, but in reality, it's quite uncommon. However, 99 to 95% of them um, are due to a break that we find when we look. So we see this attachment, we, we ask you know, whether a resident or a medical student or you know, a fellow to take a look and you know, they find a break 90, 95% of the time. Uh, the other 5% of the time in this type of detachment, we don't find a break, but that's often because we have a difficult time seeing it. Either it's too small or it's difficult to see, or there's some other cause. Um, and the thing that you want to know is that a lot of patients have symptoms, but not all. And so this statistic is pretty old now, I think, but um, even up to a third of patients can present with a detachment. Um, they don't have symptoms. So um, a lot of the times it's a small detachment or they may notice a floater or two or they're just in for a routine eye exam. But not everybody who has a detachment presents with a detachment has symptoms because of it. And again, this statistic's probably old um, and it's, it's less so than this because of advances in technology and stuff and patients' uh, knowledge about it. But, but it's not always something that they come in saying, oh my God, I lost my vision. So that's important to know. So what does it look like? So I have a couple of pictures now um, with exceptions at the end, which I will show you. Um, all of these images are from a really good resource for everyone. It's called the ASRS Image Bank, the American Society Retina Specialist Image Bank. It's free. I think you just have to make an account and it's searchable like Google, but it's for retina and ophthalmology and you can just type in whatever. Now, the, the trick is like all things, you kind of need to know what you're looking for, but most of the time they're well they're well um, curated by retina specialists. And I included the person's name here because um, you know, obviously they took a good uh, photo for us and we can use it today. So here's the first one. So um, this is an example of a detachment and it looks maybe different than some other ones you have seen either on rotation or in photos. Here's another one, uh, this is from Diego, uh, another type of detachment. And again, I showed you the photo of the nerve and the vessels and this does not look like that. Okay, um, and then here's a final one. Again, the nerve and the vessels, and then this like rimply water kind of thing that that you can tell. And, and I have another uh, area where we can show you a little bit more in detail. But this area here, uh, and I'll see if I can annotate it. Um, but this area here, clearly, and this area here, where the lines are drawn, is very different than this area here. This area looks nice and 
flat. All the vessels are running straight here and here they're kind of going up. That means there's elevation here. There's fluid underneath. You can kind of tell it's kind of like a wave, right? It's going up here. Um, so yeah, so these are three types of detachments. They're all retinal, uh, retinal detachments. They're all regmatogenous and there's a break associated with all of them. So that's good. All right. So the question everybody has is what is Mac on and Mac off? So I don't know if you guys want to go ahead and start putting some stuff in the chat. What does Mac on mean? And what does Mac off mean? And why is it important? Why do people care? Why do people ask you, you know, is it Mac on? Is it Mac off? Is it Mac on? Is it Mac off? Right. Danielle's right. Yeah. Macula detached or not. Good. Why is it important, Danielle, though? What's the, what's the reason? Why do people care? Are they just being sticklers? Are they just trying to pimp? By the way, pimping is an old term. I don't know if it's still in practice. Maybe they've like changed the term, but it used to be something that, um, you know, staff and attendings used to do to, to ask students question after question. So worst prognosis with macular detachment. Uh, urgency of treatment, good. Macula affects most of vision. Yeah. So, so if the macula is on, is the vision good or not as good? If the macula is on, what do you guys think? It's better. Yep. Vision's usually, usually not always, but usually yes. Very good. And if the macula is off, is the vision good or bad? And the answer is, uh, it depends. Depends how long it's been off and how off it is. And I can kind of give you ideas, but, but that's right. And the urgency is important. So the urgency is probably the reason that we care. So again, whether the fluid that I showed you crosses the macula uh, tells us whether it's Mac on or Mac off. Now, the truth is I'm showing you the macula here. It's the circle. And again, people describe it differently. Um, but people don't actually say Mac on to mean Mac on. What they, what they mean to say, instead of Mac on, they mean fovea on. So it's kind of a weird way of saying, is the fovea attached versus the macula? Because the macula is bigger than most people think, like I'm showing you here. So if there's a little bit of fluid, I'll give you an example here. And this is kind of a terminology problem. But it's important for you guys to know because somebody may ask you one day. So if the fluid kind of extends over here and say like the area here, I'll show you, I'll just give you an example, but say this area here is detached. Well, the macula is partially off, right? Macula is partially off, but we don't call that Mac off. We call that Mac on because really what we're really caring about is the part of the macula that, that matters, it's here. Now, sometimes people will, and I'm gonna maybe use a different color if I, if I can remember how to do this. So sometimes people will say, well, 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 is the macula on or off? Well, the fluid crosses the fovea. And some people have another term that they like to use and that's called Mac split. And that's not a real thing because um, you know it doesn't really exist, but it's a way for doctors like us to talk to each other and to say, well, is this fovea affected recently because half of it's off, maybe part of it's off or just off. And which means, yes, although it's off, it's kind of recent, therefore we should probably do something about it. Uh, and so Mac split is pretty much synonymous with Mac on in terms of urgency. That's what we're trying to say. It's like a, it's like a cheat code for us to talk to each other. Um, but yeah, so this, these terms are important because people use them, but just important to know what people mean. Okay, so why does Mac on, Mac off matter? So again, like we talked about, um, there's a lot of variability. So people, you know, are very different in opinion. Um, can you guys, can you hear me, Iman? Because I have a different mic now working. Yeah, no, 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 it's perfect. I think perfect. someone joined. Yeah, we can hear you. The link. No problem, that's good. So um, we could so, hear you well before as well and now. So everything's okay. good, thank you. No problem, just let me know if it changes. I'll, I'll, I'll just stay with this one because I think this one's okay. So if the macula is on, then usually the vision's good. And like we were talking about before, you wanna fix the problem sooner. What you don't want is you don't want the macula to detach because once it's dead or the fovea, again, using different words, but that's what we mean to say. Once the fovea comes off, then the vision drops. And although we can fix it, vision recovery is not as good if it's off for a while. So that's where the urgency comes in. Once the fovea slash macula is off, the vision's already decreased. So we're not as you know, ready to go forward and, and treat it. Although we do want to treat it pretty soon and different studies will disagree on this and different doctors will disagree on this. But there, you know, 
Urgency can be three to seven days. Most people say five, you wanna get it within five days, but that can be totally different if it's something that's chronic. So if it's been like months that it's been off, then you, know, you don't have to rush in five days, right? Uh, or if you have a Mac on detachment, the Mac flow has been on for months. And there's examples of that I won't go into today, but well, it's been on for five months, well, nothing's gonna change in three days. So you can wait a week, two weeks, even longer sometimes. Sometimes you watch it, sometimes you do other stuff. But those are special cases. So really, I want you guys to think about these norm, most of the time cases, which are, if it's on, you wanna fix it pretty quickly. If it's off, then you got maybe three to seven, maybe five months left. So. All right, so what causes a rental detachment, uh, regmatogenous? So I don't know if you guys wanna put some stuff in the chat. What do you think is the main cause? I kind of mentioned it already, uh, but, um, but maybe give me some ideas of things that cause a detachment, a regmatogenous detachment. Okay, great. Awesome. So some good, some good answers. So, <clears throat> so we have a couple of things. So we have things that cause it. So things like a retinal hole. I like a retinal hole. Retinal hole is one of the causes. Um, then there's like risk factors, which, you know, you're mentioning, Carmen's mentioning and Brianna's mentioning. So things like family history, absolutely. Trauma, of course, absolutely. About lattice degenerations is a risk factor. Um, swelling in the eye, um, yes, absolutely. It's actually one of the three types of detachments that we're going to talk about. Regmatogenous, less so. Um, but if you mean like trauma, then absolutely. Swelling on its own, yes, can do it, but it's going to be in the third category that we're going to talk about. And high myopia, of course, is a, is a risk factor too. So you guys kind of hit, hit most of them there. So to kind of give you an example, this is again from the American Academy. This is Mark Miller. He does a lot of great stuff. I mean, I've never met the person, but he, he has taught a lot of people um, through his drawings. And this is a, you know, an example of the many types of lesions, retinal things that can cause detachments. Any, anywhere from holes to lattice generation with holes to horseshoe tears, operculum, et cetera, dialysis at the bottom. So all of these things can cause a detachment. And, excuse me, and I'm just going to highlight a few. These are kind of the common ones, the ones that you want to know about. So flap tear or horseshoe tear, that is probably the one that you're going to encounter most. And it looks like a horseshoe, and I'll show you some examples. And usually people come in, not always, but usually they come in because they notice floaters, sometimes flashes of light or photopsias, or both. Oh, you know, I had like a big floater a couple of days ago, and now I see like flashes, and now a lot of little tiny dots. Um, that's probably a tear, not always, but usually. A percolated hole, which is number three, I'll skip over two for a second, but a percolated hole is similar. Um, it just looks different. And then number two, the genital tear, that's a special type of tear. It's not dissimilar to the first one. It's just really big. And the management is different. Usually the risk factors are different. Um, and I have a couple examples of that. Retinal dialysis is not a retinal tear, uh, but actually what it is, is when the retina, instead of inserting, and I don't know if you guys can see me, but instead of inserting where it's supposed to at the edge of the eye, where I showed you at the front, it's actually disinserting from the, uh, from the edge of the eye. So the actual retina is like not torn anywhere. It's just not inserted where it's supposed to be and it creates a space underneath. And that's a special type of, um, of problem. And that's usually related to trauma. Um, and then a trophic hole is a special type of hole that usually does not lead to a detachment, uh, but can rarely do, uh, lead to a detachment. And a lot of people, even people in this chat, uh, probably have atrophic holes. It doesn't mean they, have, they get detachments and we don't have to necessarily treat them. In fact, we don't usually treat them. And I don't want to scare anybody there, okay? Um, and somebody asked, how does the vitreous detachment lead to retinal detachment? That's a great question. Um, and I think I, I may have a slide, I'm not sure, but essentially the vitreous, the gel in the eye, um, as you get older, pulls away from the retina. So if I go to um, this slide here and we're on 24, so I can go to, uh, sorry, this one here, um, the vitreous gel, just uh, answer this question because I think it's a good one that I hope I covered, but I may not have. Um, the vitreous gel is in here, right? This is the vitreous. It's clear in this image because they kind of have to make it that way. But when you're born, it's attached at all these points all the way around. 
and including the fovea and the nerve. And as you get older, the gel is made of collagen and it's kind of like a lattice, you know, it's kind of like strand on top of strand on top of strand like this. And that's why it's clear. And if you mess up the strands, it becomes unclear, kind of like tape, that if you kind of crumple it up, it's no longer clear. Well, as you get older, the uh, configuration of these strands changes because the amount of water in between the strands increases and that causes it to become more liquid. So instead of being like a thick jello-like substance, like you would see kind of like a you know, jello that you eat, it becomes more like water, more like viscous water. And then the older you get, it's more watery. And that change actually contracts the gel. If you think about taking a bottle of water, putting it in the freezer, it expands, right? And when you take it out, it contracts. The same thing uh, happens here. So that contraction pulls the jelly away from the retina. And what you end up having at the end, instead of the gel kind of attached to the retina, it's partially attached to the retina, maybe like this. Um, it's never fully detached. It always remains attached here, here, and many other areas. But that pulling away from the retina is what we call a posterior, this is the posterior side, vitreous detachment. And that's what a PVD is. And in that setting, the pulling is a force. You're actually pulling away from tissue you, that you're stuck to. And that can actually cause a tear. Just like if you have tape and you pull away from paper, sometimes you get away with it, and sometimes you don't. And that's what happens with these tears, okay? And that's a great question from students. I hope your name's not student, uh, but it's just your profession. So that's great. So um, we're gonna go back to share. Let's go back to slide, slide 24. Let's go to 24. Um, pardon my dad jokes, you know, that's all I got. Okay, so here's an example of something we already saw. So what kind of tears do we see here? I don't know if you guys wanna just shout it out in the chat um, and then I'll give you the answer right away. Okay, so Carmen says, who should first there to be any other types of tears in this particular photo? A hole in a horseshoe, beautiful, great. So here's the horseshoe and there's the hole. And um, yeah, it's, it's very often you see multiple breaks in a detached retina. Now this retina is detached and you can see the detachment and I think I have it maybe in the next slide, um, not really. But, um, but to go back to kind of what it looks like, Here's the retina, and you see this ripple here? The detachment, it goes all the way around there. That's actually detached all the way here. And the fovea is right here. So it's almost hitting the fovea, but not quite. People would call this a MAC split, like I described before. I mean, I don't know if that's a real thing. I call this a MAC on and threatening the fovea, and that's why we would do surgeries pretty soon. And this is literally a break. I mean, the retina, this thing here used to be right here. Uh, and it's broken off. And the jelly that uh, you know, our, our student asked um, is attached to this and has pulled away. And that's where the break comes from. Uh, this hole here usually is not related to jelly pulling away. It's just the hole. And this is what I talked about, a tropical before. Um, there may be gel associated with it, but it's not usually caused by the gel pulling away from it. And that's the difference between the horseshoe and this one. Great, great answers, great question. We're gonna move along. Let's go to the next one works. Um, so here's our next one. Uh, a little bit trickier. What do you guys think about this one? What kind of break is this out of the ones we talked about? Does it even look like retina? Yikes. Yeah, I know. Tell me about it. Do not want to deal with this one. So where's the nerve, first of all? Can we even, can we even tell? So this is a tropic, not a, bad, not a bad thought. It's definitely very different than the one we saw. This is the special giant retinal tear. So it's very giant because the entire retina is flopped over on itself. So this retina here used to be over here. And this is the nerve and this is underneath this flap the fovea is underneath it. And this retina is supposed to hang out over there. You can see the edge up at the top and the edge over here. These are really tough to fix. 
um, and they don't usually do as well. They're, they're tough surgeries. Um, they can do well, but they usually don't. Usually people like this either have trauma or have some sort of syndrome, like a collagen disorder, like Marfan, Stickler syndrome. They have, they're not just normal eyes. They usually have something going on, and trauma is usually more of them. High myopia can do it, but usually not. Here's another example of the same thing. This is a little bit less so. Uh, again, a giant retinal tear. The retina that you see here uh, belongs, instead of being here, this stuff's supposed to be over here. And they usually roll over like this and they're hard to manage. And uh, you have to treat them very differently. They're not like your normal, normal type of detachment or tear. Um, this one, a little bit more straightforward. Anybody wanna guess this one? And it's, there's like a two part to this, so maybe not as fair. I really couldn't find a great photo for this one. A percolated hole, fantastic, yeah, that's what that is. So this is actually a percolated hole that's been lasered. So this white stuff here is laser that somebody did. And this plug of retina, this is a piece of retina, used to be inside there. And now it's floating above it somewhere. And that's what, that's what an percolated hole looks like. Sometimes they start off as a tear. So they start off like this. And then that piece of retina that's kind of like this one here will run away and, and be torn off completely. Not always, but sometimes. Uh, now there's a big debate and you, you may be asked or, or you, know, uh, you may be asked to kind of discuss it at some point um, of whether you should treat these at all. And uh, it's maybe not for this talk. The answer is probably, but not always. Um, treat these appropriate holes. Good. All right, good. Very good. Here's another example, same thing, uh, for clear hole. And they're sometimes hard to see in the clinic, but once you see your first one, if you have already, then it's kind of fun. Uh, fun, I mean, fun for, for work in ophthalmology. Here's a piece of retina, it used to belong inside there. Okay, good. All right, um, let me, sorry about the annotations, clear all of them. Okay, good, so we're gonna move along. So um, each of these has a different risk profile, right? So the horseshoe tears are probably the worst. If you treat them, they're better. If you don't treat them, they are more likely to cause attachments. These are really old studies. And I'll tell you why these are old studies for a couple of reasons. These are old studies because nobody in their right mind would leave a horseshoe tear now and conduct a study because we kind of know. So you're not going to get like a brand new study. Oh, you know, we left this horseshoe tear, you know, for 10 years No. So that's why you're not going to see a lot of new stuff. This is old stuff before. Uh, we knew what to do, and I mean, I wasn't around either, but um, but it was before we kind of knew what to do, and we were watching a little bit more. Also, our technology was not as good, we, although we had lasers uh, in the 70s and, and 80s. Um, we weren't really using it for this um, for this purpose, right? Um, and, uh, and so the main takeaway here is horseshoe tears, if you don't treat them, and they're symptomatic, which is another thing, um, usually can cause attachments, and there's a high rate of them causing detachments. If you do treat them, there's still a chance they can cause a detachment because the laser is not perfect, uh, but a lot less than untreated ones. Um, and the percolated holes are less likely. And that's the, the bottom part of this, uh, of this chart. Okay, so what causes tears? Uh, I'm not gonna go into this, but the answer really is what, what our, our, our student, 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 student uh, said was a procedure detachment. That's most of the time. Um, the jelly pulls away like I showed, and because it's really firmly attached at the vitreous base, which is that area on either side at the top, most tears are going to occur there. Uh, also attached to the optic nerve, to the macula, and to the blood vessels. So sometimes pulling away can actually cause a hemorrhage, a vitreous hemorrhage, or um, could cause a, um, a subrenal hemorrhage sometimes. It's unlikely, but can do it. Um, and so just because you see blood in the eye, uh, don't assume it's it's just blood from something else. It most often is, in most cases, uh, in the setting of somebody who doesn't have diabetes, it's going to be a tear. Um, and most PVDs or posterior vitreous detachments are subclinical, which means they occur and nobody notices it. And again, 60, maybe even more percent of PVDs occur on their own without any symptoms at all. And what I tell patients and I tell like residents and fellows and medical students is, a posterior vicious attachment is not a disease. Uh, it's just aging of the eye. It occurs in all people eventually. Um, it's like, you know, arthritis. Arthritis is not a disease. Yes, 
People can have different forms of arthritis, but osteoarthritis, as long as you live long enough and you walk and you, you know, do normal things that normal people do, you're going to get arthritis, right? You may pass away earlier because of heart disease or car accident, whatever, and you don't get it. But if, as long as you live long enough, you get it. Same thing here with PVDs. They are not a disease. However, just like arthritis or osteoarthritis is not a disease, it can cause problems, right? And same thing with PVDs. They can cause problems. And one of them is the retinal detachment. And they do that through retinal tears. And that's why everybody who comes in who has flashes and floaters, which are usually the symptom of a PVD, needs to be investigated or, or looked at for a potential retinal tear because they don't know they have a retinal tear until you look and see it. Okay, good. And risk factors for PVDs, we kind of mentioned some of them. So I'll go through them a little bit. So age, I already talked about. Um, aphakia means, you know, you're not having a lens. So if your lens in your eye is removed and you're left without one, then you have a risk factor for getting a PVD. Uh, pseudophakia is when they remove your lens and they put another one in like an implant. Uh, but if you have cataract surgery and put a lens in, but there's a complication where the um, the lens capsule is, is broken in some way, that can also cause a PVD. Uh, uveitis is inflammation of the eye and that can also cause it. Trauma goes without saying, vitreous hemorrhage, uh, VH is usually vitreous hemorrhage and ophthalmology, and that can also cause it. And axial myopia or length of the eye, we talked about before, is also a risk factor for PVD. And all of these things happen to also be risk factors for retinal tears for the very same reason that the PVD is. And again, if you have a PVD and you show up to the clinic and you guys are going to be working there, um, if you have a PVD, it doesn't mean you have a retinal tear, but depending on the study, people have quoted anywhere between 7 to 20% of, of PVDs that have symptoms, so floaters or flashes, may have a tear. That's why you have to look. And if you have a vitreous hemorrhage or blood inside the eye, it's much more likely, in the setting of a PVD, much more likely that you have a retinal tear. And if you have pigment, uh, and again, this is maybe outside the realms of this talk, but not hemorrhage, but rather pigmented cells in the vitreous, um, usually those are retinal pigment epithelial cells, which are located underneath the retina. If you have those floating around and you can see those at the slit lamp and next time you're around a slit lamp with somebody who, who can show you, um, that's called something called Schaefer sign, named after a guy named Schaefer. But um, that particular finding makes it much more likely in the setting of a PVD that you have a rental tear. And so these are ways for you to clue in, okay, there's probably something going on. I got to look really closely. If you don't have a view and say you have a hemorrhage and a person um, who just developed one, you have to assume there's probably a tear. And you do that by doing an ultrasound, something we call a B scan in ophthalmology. And sometimes you just got to do surgery to, to, to figure it out. And that's maybe a difficult decision sometimes to make. And again, outside the scope of this talk, but, but understanding that these tears occur is important for you to look for them. Even if you don't see it right away, you may bring the patient back sooner than, than maybe somebody who doesn't have some of these symptoms or findings. Okay, do you guys have any questions about stuff so far? Um, anything I'd go over before I go into the last bit here? I'll, I'll take silence as a no, but feel free to comment anytime. Okay, so some predisposing lesion, uh, lesions, we're just gonna go quickly over some of them. Lattice degeneration um, is probably the one you wanna know most about, and I have a photo of it coming up, but, it is an abnormal vitreous retinal interface. And that is, again, not a disease, but it's present in a lot of people. And in people who are nearsighted, it's more common. And those who have family history of it, it's more common. But once you have lattice, you're more likely to get detachments. There's a really good study in people with detachments. And it's read very wrong by many doctors, actually. And the study really talks about the fact that in people with detachments, a lot of them have lattice. That doesn't mean that lattice is very commonly le uh, leading to detachments. What that means is the opposite, actually. What it means is that people, once they have a detachment, they are more likely to have had lattice in the past, rather than if you have lattice, you, uh, you get a detachment. It's actually a question of probability, right? So just because A uh, leads to B doesn't mean that all B has A. Um, and that's something that you will often come about when you see patients with lattice and such people say, well, we got to treat the lattice, right? Because a lot of detachments have lattice. Well, 
yeah, that's 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 fine, but a lot of lattice doesn't lead to detachment. And so the, the general rule of thought about lattice, and again, this is one of those alerts where people disagree, but most retina specialists think that lattice should not be treated on its own. And that's why a lot of young people, people who are in their 20s, I see in my clinic, um, I see medical students, I see residents, I see physicians who have tons of lattice. And I say, well, look, we're going to watch it. If you have lattice and you have detached from it in one eye, we're going to treat your other eye to prevent it. And that's a different story. But most of the time, we just watch it. So if you've been told personally, for instance, that you have lattice, doesn't mean you have to laser it or treat it prophylactically, although some people choose to. And that's the question. So here's a picture of lots of lattice, okay? And I think I have a thing. So if we go here and we draw, so this stuff here is the lattice. So there's a bunch of them going all the way around. And the black little dots are a laser that's scarred down that somebody did. It's not wrong. This is a ton of lattice, okay? It's not wrong to laser this again, but most retina people would say, well, uh, lasering is not benign either. So maybe watching it, I would probably have lasered this to be honest myself, but, uh, but most people don't present with this much lattice. And if they do, it's sometimes okay to watch it also. And this is what lattice, this is a really good photo of it. And again, this uh, image bank is, is a good resource for you guys also. Highly recommend you guys make an account. Pretty sure you can. If you can't, let me know. Send me an email and I'll try to see if I can sort it out. So uh, again, it's important because it predisposes you. Um, so here's a good study where they proved that you don't have to do anything. Three out of 423 eyes that were followed develop retinal detachment. That's less than you, know, you would think, right? Uh, however, the next part would disagree. And this is where people messed it up. In 20 to 30% of eyes that present with detachments, they have lattice. Well, great, but they missed the point here. So just remember kind of this slide, I think it's really important. So it's not recommended unless the fellow eye has an RD or, or giant tear or something. A lot of people still treat it. And it's a discussion that you have with the patient. Some patients are just risk averse. They say, well, I just want to treat it. I want to live my life and not worry about it. Fine, that's fine. And we can do that, but, but it's not necessarily uh, the right thing to do all the time. There's other reasons, I won't go into them. These are kind of like esoteric stuff and they all can lead, but are less likely to detachments. And, uh, and this is some other stuff that, and I'll just get this for, uh, for brevity, um, other things that aren't really uh, gonna lead to detachments. These white things that you see on the periphery of the retina, here's an example of one. That's very commonly you see these white little patches around the, the periphery that doesn't lead to any detachment. Um, so the question is, when do you treat a break? So I don't know if you guys want to answer, when would you treat a break? And I gave you some options already. When would you treat a break? And um, give you maybe 20 seconds, maybe give me some options. When would you treat a break? History of rental attachment. Right, yeah, so I mean, yeah, I guess if you had a rental detachment and it was an untreated break, you definitely wanna do it, that's good. Mac on, yeah, absolutely. So if you already have a detachment, symptomatic is great. So if people notice floaters, you're gonna treat a break, very good. Threatening central vision, again, fantastic, very good. If it's a detachment, it's really leading to central vision. Um, good, so there's a lot of reasons to treat breaks. So acute symptomatic is the big one. If they're a horseshoe tear, like I showed you, and they're symptomatic, you definitely wanna treat it. Even if it's asymptomatic, if it's a horseshoe tear, you probably want to treat it because those are, like I said before, commonly can lead to problems. Acute operculated holes, again, there's a little bit of a debate here, but if the operculated hole is acute and people notice, probably treat. If there's a vitreous hemorrhage, probably treat. Uh, if it's been there for a long time, don't have to necessarily treat it. Atrophic holes, you do not need treatment. And that's difficult for me to kind of convey to you because you have to see a bunch of these to kind of tell them apart. But Atrophic holes are not related to traction. They just occur there. And a lot of people have atrophic holes. In fact, like I said, a lot of people in the audience probably do. Uh, they don't even know it and that's okay. They don't lead to problems and you don't need to treat them necessarily. Very rarely do they cause problems. Very good. So, um, you know, asymptomatic retinal breaks, this is a big discussion, but usually they progress less commonly to detachments. So you treat them if they're accompanied by lattice or person's really high myop, myop, or if they have a detachment already, obviously, if the other eye had a problem. Um, if they're one-eyed, actually, this is another good reason. You know, if they only have one eye, probably a good idea to treat. And uh, asymptomatic hole is not always a good idea. 
And lattice, like I said, again, you only need to treat in certain conditions and not always need to treat. Okay, so trauma, this last piece of this part. So trauma is very uncommon in ophthalmology in terms of retinal detachments, but when it does occur, usually it's something called a dialysis. And I'll show you a picture. There's not very good pictures out there on, on the internet. I have a couple of patients. The problem is dialysis is really far out and you can never get a good photo. And so all I'm trying to say with this uh, uh, um, picture here is that the retina ends here. And really this piece should be over here and there's no more retina there. So the retina is not broken anywhere. It kind of just disinserted itself. And that's, a dialysis, it's usually really far out. It's really hard to see and usually related to trauma. It's usually at the bottom of the eye. Usually young men, um, men are more likely to get into traumatic events uh, as compared to women. And uh, usually um, it's not picked up right away. It can happen even months or years later that it's picked up because it's a very slow process. And they're usually difficult to treat or can be difficult to treat. Good. And let's see. Good, very good. And again, this is what I said before, but most of the time it's not right away. So again, if somebody has trauma and you see them and like they're great, the message I want you to take away in terms of retina is it's not right away that you wanna worry about. It's three months, six months, 12 months, two years, three years, four years later, because these people will carry a risk for the rest of their lives. And sometimes their attachment comes two, three years later. Good. And we went through this already, so I'll just, quickly go over it, but there's a lot of risk factors for RD. So being a man because of the trauma, uh, younger age. Uh, so younger is relative, but younger in my practice is 40 to 60, and as opposed to 70, 80, or 90. And myopia, being nearsighted, anxial length goes with myopia, so having a long eye. Having a complicated cataract surgery is the next one. Trauma, like I said, having a tear or predisposing lesion. Um, there's some meds that can do it too, and I won't go into that, but recent surgery, I said, uh, Family history, of course. Uh, the other eye had an RD, of course. And then certain systemic diseases like collagen disorders, et cetera. And having cataract surgery recently is, is one of them, but it's not that common. So cataract surgery is very safe. This number is not, not appropriate. One to 3% is an old number. It's much less than that now because we're much better at cataract surgery. Our equipment's much better. And there is such a thing as having a detachment that nobody picks up for a long, long time. And in those cases, you don't always need to treat it. And that's a complicated thing that, you know, is the topic of its own discussion. Um, and how to treat? Well, there's a lot of ways to treat it. But really, the point is you want to find the break, you want to fix the break, and then you want to fix the detachment. And there's three ways to do that. So either with a buckle surgery, scleral buckle, something called a vitrectomy, where we go in to remove the jelly that causes the problem. And then pneumatic is a kind of a newer-ish approach, newer-ish, like 30 years, but still pretty new, um, approach where you don't go to surgery at all, you just do it in the clinic with a gas bubble and some laser. Um, and that works fairly well in most cases also. Um, good. So I did have these videos, but I think for brevity, I'll probably skip them. And um, I'll, we'll be able to link um, some good YouTube stuff for you. Uh, and as talking to uh, Paige and Iman and, and the group about maybe at some point you could do just like a surgery um, kind of show so you guys can see what it's like. Um, but uh, maybe in your own time, you can go, out, go ahead and look what the surgeries look like. Because I think they are very interesting, at least I think so, because I decided to go into it. Um, but we'll skip it now because I have some cases that I think are more interesting. Okay, good. So I'll skip this stuff. So really short part two and part three. So tractional RD, this is a special type of rental detachment. And usually it has nothing to do with a break, although you can get a break. It's usually because of some pulling force from the middle of the eye pulling towards the middle. And the most common is diabetes. But the second most common is actually, oh, there's no slide showing, no slide showing. Let me screen share, stop share. I can see the slides. You can see them? Well. Okay, everybody see them? Okay, Iman saying no, but, but everybody sees them, so. Mon, maybe just change your, okay, good, we're good. Carmen says yes. Um, okay, so tractional RD is a special type of detachment uh, and diabetes is the most common cause, uh, but probably the second, and I didn't put these in correct order, but the second cause is PBR. And that's something called proliferative vitreoretinopathy. retinopathy. That's actually when you get scar tissue developed on, in and under the retina after a retinal detachment surgery. Um, so especially young people, they have a retinal detachment, you do surgery, goes great. 
And then like three, six, 12, two years later, whatever, usually not two years, but maybe within three to six months, they can develop scar tissue. And that scar tissue grows like crazy and just pulls everything together, kind of like in a cauliflower configuration. And that can be really, really nasty in terms of surgery. And those are different types of detachments. And here's a couple examples. So this is an example of somebody who had surgery before and um, oops, had surgery before. And here's old laser stuff. This is old laser up here. And here's a break actually, but this break's not caused by the jelly pulling on it. No, no, no. There's scarring right here. There's like a little flower of scar tissue and scar being pulled right to the center of the eye. So pulling this area this way. And that's why you have this break develop. And then you get a detachment, which is really difficult to fix, really, really challenging. Um, and they're different than regmatogenous ones because the cause is not usually the break itself. The cause is the break is caused by the pulling traction. Uh, very good. So this is another one, and this is a really nasty one. Actually, this one's pretty stable. I wouldn't touch this eye, but um, this scar tissue is all the way around. This is a person with diabetes. They've had a lot of laser here, and their center vision right in the middle is fine. So I probably leave them alone, like cross my fingers, um, and try not to touch anything and disturb it. But this is a type of traction. Good. So how do you manage these? Uh, yeah, surgery is the only way. There's no other way to do it. Um, and you kind of can't, you, you can do a buckle, but you have to do a vitrectomy. And it's usually a really challenging surgery. This can take hours, you know, like um, I, we were gonna do some videos today, but they're so long, I had to cut them. So we'll, again, have to do maybe another session, but some of these take like two, three hours to fix, sometimes longer. And usually there's a couple people um, kind of devoting their careers to this because it's kind of, it's not even, it, it's not that it's, 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 it's challenging and it's wonderful, and it's fantastic, but it's time, time consuming and it's like a labor of love. And you gotta have to devote like sometimes half a day to it. And it's not feasible in all centers. So if you work in certain areas where, you know, like they have limited resources, they're not gonna, it's not that they don't want you to, they really do. They just don't have the money, the time or the resources to allow you to do a four hour case. Um, they'd rather do like three, you know, one hour cases or four one hour cases. Um, and so for that reason, there's only a few centers that really do this. So usually academic centers so like at U of T, you know, Hamilton, Ottawa, you know, Kingston, London. So there's a few places, but in the, in the community hospitals where there is retina being performed in Canada and the US, it's much less likely. So essentially all of these or most of these are being done in academic centers, not always, but almost always. And the final one is um, a different type of detachment completely. And this is kind of, um, poorly named perhaps, but it's, a, it's appropriate in terms of the retina is being detached, but it's exudative. And exudative is actually not a form of surgical um, type of fix. So you don't usually go in and do surgery. Very rarely do you do surgery for these. Usually these are related to some inflammation or something else going on. And here's an example of one. So I don't know if anybody, nobody's seen this, I can guarantee it. But if you have, and you put in what the diagnosis is, um, you know, I'll send you like a $20 Starbucks card if you're right. So if anybody wants to get, get, a, get a take at a $20 Starbucks gift card, um, you got like 10 seconds here. Let me know what you think the diagnosis of this particular eye is. And I will, I'll accept any and all answers. So if you're completely off, don't worry about it. You know, nobody's going to judge you here. But, um, but what do you think this is? It's an exudative type of detachment. AMD, not bad. Retinal hemorrhage. There's some hemorrhaging. Yep. Very good. Very good. I will accept all answers that are close, but um, there's only one right answer, unfortunately, but I will, I'll definitely accept all answers. There's no stupid answers here because when I was an M1, M2, M3, M4, R1, R2, I would not have been able to get this. So don't worry. So um, yeah, so there's a lot of uh, yellow stuff. Does anyone want to guess what the yellow stuff is? Coats disease, Daniel. Daniel with a $20 gift card and we're, we're closing it. Very good. If you Googled it, it's totally fine. Just look at the gift card. That's great. This is Coates disease. This is a really um, uh, bad presentation of it, but Coates is an exudative type of detachment. You get cholesterol. This is the yellow stuff that you see. And the red is usually hemorrhaging, like uh, was mentioned. And, um, and uh, 
usually affects men more commonly than women, usually one eye, but can be both. And uh, this is a really nasty presentation. And it's exudative. So all the fluids under the retina, you're not going to fix it with surgery. In fact, this eye here is not going to change at all. And you're probably going to watch it, unfortunately, and, and, and hope, hope it doesn't get worse. Uh, and probably will stay the same for a while. Um, very good, very good, very good, very good. Okay, another $20 gift card on the Daniel. Even if you know this one, unfortunately, you can't win two. But anybody want to guess what this thing here is? And again, twenty dollars on the line. I'll be happy to. We'll coordinate with them on or page or I don't know how, but we'll we'll sort it out. We'll we'll send you guys a gift card if you win this. So for first to get it, um, it might be only one, but go ahead. Ten seconds, maybe. I'll put ten seconds on the clock with Jeopardy. Choroidal tumor, not bad, not a bad idea. It's not it, but but, but smart, very good, very good. This is a really tricky one because it's not even a normal presentation, although it has some classic features, but um, it's hard it's hard to see the, uh, this type of thing. Um, yeah, so uh, eye melanoma, again, not bad. I mean, it, it could look like this sometimes for sure, but it's not. So RPE, dysgenesis, wow, Brooklyn, good, but that's not it, but good. Um, Marietta Fold, Carmen, Good, nice try. Uh, those, um, I was gonna show some irregular folds. Those are hard to image sometimes. They're usually more peripheral. Tenebrae toxicity, I love it, I uh, love it. One, maybe maybe five more seconds here. Five more seconds and then we'll, uh, we'll, 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 we'll hold, uh, we'll stop holding our breaths. Okay, all right, no more here. So here we go. So this is uh, VKH. VKH, um, you're probably gonna see a bunch. Depends on where you um, end up working uh, or doing your electives uh, or doing residency. BKH is predominantly seen in a number of populations. It's an HLA associated inflammatory disease and they present with exudative detachments and some other things also. Really cool disease if you wanna read about it. Um, usually in East and Southeast Asian populations more commonly and also in um, you know, Native Canadian, uh, Native American populations as well. And so in parts of Ontario and parts of BC and definitely in the prairies, we have a lot of you know, um, native Canadian populations that are more at risk. And also depending on where you are in the larger centers, we have a large population of patients uh, from um, uh, East and Southeast Asia, particularly Japan. As you can tell, the Harada in, is, not, is a Japanese name. So um, that's primarily the people you'll see with this particular disease. Really cool, is the optic nerve small? The optic nerve is small, that's good. Uh, it's a detachment of the macula also, not just inferiorly. And it's kind of a crowded disc and it's really yellowy. This is not a normal appearance. And this is kind of some of the hints that this is this disease. But you're right, the optic nerve is a little block, absolutely. Um, but yeah, really cool disease, you can read about it. Um, there's a differential for these type of um, exudative RDs and this is not all inclusive. iWiki does a great job with most things, including this. Um, but, uh, but you can think about many things that can cause an exudative RD. Excuse me. The important thing when you see a renal detachment is to determine, is it regmatogenous? Is it tractional? Or is it exudative? If it's, a, if it's exudative, you have to kind of put your in, you know, internal medicine hat on because you almost always, it's a medical diagnosis and you have to treat it medically. And whether you treat it with steroids or with antibiotics and et cetera, matters. Um, and so that's the, the process of exudative RDs. They're much more challenging to treat, I think. It's easy to be a surgeon. As a surgeon, it's easy for me to fix a renal detachment. It's much harder to, to think about some of this other stuff sometimes. And you have to make sure that you slow down and, and, and correctly assess. When I was a resident, um, I knew of a case, um, and it wasn't me, but again, I was there, where uh, an exudative renal detachment was taken to the operating room. And it was determined inside that it was exudative. And that's okay, the patient did fine. But those things wanna be, you wanna avoid those things because uh, an exudative RD that undergoes surgery does really poorly, usually, not always, but usually. And so you wanna avoid those going to the OR. Okay, good. We're gonna end with some cases, okay? So I really want as much participation as you guys feel comfortable. Hopefully you guys are comfortable and just spewing answers out. And uh, we'll try to get you guys to dinner, hopefully, or, or late, um, late snack. So here we go, case one. And we're gonna use all our information that we learned today. Okay, so what do we got? What do you guys see here? What type of detachment? What's going on? How are we gonna fix it?
and feel free to just say whatever, you know, no wrong answer. I mean, there's a wrong answer obviously, but that's okay. It's not for this forum to judge. Regmatogenous detachment, perfect. Do you guys see a break? Is it Mac on or is it Mac off? Mac off, not good. Mac off, very good. Um, all right, is this the first time this person's had an attachment? Or we're not sure? No. Carmen, why do you say no, Amon? Why do you say no? Why do you guys say no? Those are no. And I, I'm obviously leading you, but why, why do you think no? Laser spots. Ah, very good. Okay, good. All right. Good, good, good. Right, no Pepsi. Ah, very good. Very, very good. Um, so here's the OCT. Now, I didn't go into imaging, but OCT is optical coherence tomography. I'm sure you've seen a few, um, but uh, the macula and the fovea here is off, clearly. Those are macro party. So the things that you'll notice are a few things. It's hard to tell always, but there is, uh, like I said, a Mac off detachment and fluid goes all the way down here. There is a break up here and there's a horseshoe tear over there. And these are old laser. So this is old laser over here. And this is actually a Weiss ring, which gives us a hint. This is a Weiss ring. This is actually part of the jelly that used to attach here. This, uh, somebody said retinopexy, which is correct in terms of the laser retinopexy, but what type of retinopexy I was also referring to is something called the pneumatic retinopexy, which we mentioned briefly, but we didn't go into. This person had an in-office procedure with a gas bubble and laser. So here's the laser. The gas bubbles now disappeared. Uh, they did not do vitrectomy to fix the original detachment. It, it was fine, but then failed. And this is um, what happened. So um, not all, most retinopexies do fine. This one didn't. Um, and that's why we have a picture of it. But most are at home, you know, relaxing and we never hear about them. Um, so um, this one just happened to not do well. And again, MacOff RD, the retina ends here and the space in between is, is uh, space, fluid. And this is what it looks like. This was today, actually. So that's why I put it in here. Um, I saw him today post op week two, and he's now flat. Now, all the black stuff here was laser from the original retinopexy. None of this laser I did um in in surgery so the only laser i did in surgery and you can't really see there's a little bit here like three rows sorry there's like three rows of laser that i did um over here if i can do it so there's like three rows of laser here that i did and there's some underneath this bubble this is a gas bubble that's slowly getting smaller and smaller that's protecting the eye um and there's laser that i did here because what you didn't see in the other one he had also had a tear down here which was new but all this laser here was from a previous detachment. Now we can see it's flat, which is great. Um, and you know, surgeons always show cases that go well, so that's why you're seeing it today. Um, and this is the uh, phobia now. He's about 2050. He's going to do better, hopefully, because he has a cataract. So hopefully, he does a little bit better with time. And this is only two weeks out. Good case two. All right. I only have a couple of cases, so hopefully you guys uh, interact with this with this one here, and then. Should get you guys out. So what do you guys see? Anybody? What type of detachment is it? What are we looking at? Um, first time around, second time around. What's going on? Just pretend you're in the clinic and, and somebody's uh, asking you questions that you don't know the answer to, because that's was pretty much my experience when I was a medical student. And there's no wrong answers here. You can't say anything wrong. I mean, exudative. Good, good thought. Yep, very good. Tractional, good. It does not look like the last one, right? It looks different. So you guys are right. Tractional, okay, good. Um, all right. So what if I said it was tractional? Um, where's the traction? Where is it coming from? So tractional, you're absolutely right. And these white things here, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this stuff around here and around there. 
and stuff that you don't see here and stuff you don't see over here and stuff up here. All of this is scar tissue. And um, scar tissue is contracting. This person had attached, actually, this person had three detachment surgeries before he came to see me. And, um, you know, question was, what do we do? You know, and here's another picture of, of his eye. Sorry, you know, I've like regressed 20 years since Zoom came out. Uh, this is the same eye, same day. We're just looking at a little bit more on. And you can see the top here is pretty good. It's the bottom that's the problem in the scar tissue. Uh, but he had like three surgeries. Um, and this is, he's coming and he's like, again, you know, I'm off. Retina is falling off again. What do we do? And if we look at the OCT, this is the center part of his vision. It's good, right? Mac on, right? And if you disagree, let me know. But definitely fovea, the center part of the vision, which is the little divot here, is attached. Um, the problem is if you go a little bit further down, so I'm going to draw your attention to the left. So the line that I'm just drawing here is the center part. So, and we're down here now. So we're below the center part of the vision, right? So macula is over here. This is where we're imaging right now, where this turquoise line is right here. This is where we're imaging. And here's space, right? So we are now detached just below the phobia. So macula on or off, we can debate. People will say mac on, but split, whatever. And Say, well, what would you do? Well, this is what the detachment looks like. The red line kind of shows you where the detachment is and the red lines are where the breaks are. This scar tissue, which is in green here and all the things I showed you before, is pulling retina towards the center and ripping it up, literally ripping it into pieces. And all this white, sorry, all these red circles here are where the retina is just ripped, massive holes in the retina. And you gotta fix that. There's really no other thing you can do. You gotta go do surgery again. These are not pleasant. People don't want to fix these because usually um, they don't do well. It's hard, you know, like it takes, it just took three and a half hours. I have a three and a half hour video. I couldn't cut in time for, for this. And for that reason, these are usually challenging and patients are usually unhappy with the results because vision's often not where it, they want it to be. Um, so anyway, so, you know, this is what he looked like before. And again, I didn't have a photo. This is a photo from my, surgery. This is the end of the surgery. So at least I could show you that. So you see what we did here, but, uh, but if I show you here, this is the area, the white here is laser and the laser goes all the way around. It's really shiny. It's really, really shiny because we took all the fluid out of the eye out and we replaced it with air. And there's a little bit of fluid left, just a tiny amount. And that's why it's shiny. And the areas that you saw before that were ripped are here, but they're no longer pulling to the center. They're now flat, they're nice and flat, and the laser is now gonna scar down, create a new barrier, as if the retina has been cut in, and it actually did have to make a few cuts here to allow it to sit like this, and now it kind of sits properly. And if you cut too much, say some people will cut like over here, and you're left with a really small retina, that's usually not great because people don't have a lot of vision left. They can see the center, but not a lot in the periphery. That's called a stamp, <laughs> um, kind of a stupid name, but you understand why it's called that. The periphery, you want to save as much as possible. So that's why these surgeries take time because you're trying to save right now here. Um, yeah, so, you know, he did well. I do know of him. He lives like four hours from me, so I haven't been able to see him. I'm going to see him tomorrow, but I don't have a picture um, for, for today. But, uh, but he's three or four weeks out now. He, he's still good. He's still attached. Okay, so I have a few questions for you, and for brevity, we're just going to go through them. You guys answer in your own heads. What are three types of renal detachment? Remember, regmatogenous, tractional, and exudative. Um, within each, there's different categories. Uh, what causes a regmatogenous renal detachment? And again, there's many things, but horseshoe tears, giant tears, holes, dialysis, atrophic holes less likely, and there's other stuff too. Trauma is usually going to be dialysis related, but not always. Sometimes it can be a horseshoe tear. Uh, dialyses look different. They're hard to see. You won't probably won't see one for a while. Uh, and the risk factor is renal detachment. Again, uh, young age, usually men, being nearsighted, be having a longer eye, history of surgery, trauma, family history. Um, having cataract surgery is a risk factor, but it's not a really high one. These numbers are probably off. Uh, but it's something to remember. If they had recent surgery, especially cataract surgery, especially complicated cataract surgery, something to be concerned about. 
And when should you treat renal breaks? Well, if they're asymptomatic, if they're horseshoe tears, uh, obviously if they have a detachment, you have to treat it. Okay. And lattice, um, although can cause attachments from tears associated with lattice on their own, they're not always treated. You only treat it if the other eye had a detachment or if they only have one eye um, or some special factors. Obviously, if patients are, you know, asking you to treat because of, you know, anxiety, whatever, you have to have a discussion like any other thing uh, that you do in life. Um, and the management of renal detachments, the regmatogenous types, there's three ways to fix it. I showed a vitrectomy case here, um, but, you know, you explore a buckle, something that's like a whole course on its own, we can discuss. And pneumatic is something that, again, um, you can discuss, we can discuss separately. But um, often people will do one of these three things to fix it. Um, and the differential diagnosis of exudative, it's not all encompassing. Remember, try iWiki, it's a really good resource, but uh, you might be missing a regmatogenous or tractional detachment. This might be inflammatory, like BKH, infectious, there's other ones, neoplastic, um, tumors, people mentioned melanoma, et cetera, or other things like coats or fever, which we didn't talk about, but um, that's like another kind of genetic predisposition um, to having exudation. So um, familial exudative, vitro, uh, retinopathy. So um, many things can cause these ones. These are tricky sometimes to manage and diagnose. Okay, that was a long-winded uh, talk. I uh, really appreciate you guys. And um, if you have any questions, I'm here for you guys. And um, let me know. Happy to happy to chat.